It's time for us to get started. Thank you all for coming out this evening. We're glad that you're here. Uh, again, let me mention that we had a really good day, really good weekend out at, out at uh, the park for the retreat. Everything went really good, and Samuel obeyed the gospel, and so uh, good, a good weekend uh, for all of the young folks. Uh, again, the passing of Miss Willie Grace, and we do have the arrangements now. Uh, her body will be at Putnam Reed Funeral Home. They are visiting tomorrow from 2 until 8. That service is at 1 o'clock on Tuesday. They are also going to be receiving visitors from 10 a.m. until the time of the service Tuesday. Certainly remember that family uh, in prayer. Uh, Miss Nancy Dennis is, is home, still not feeling well, as you, might ima- as, you, as you might imagine, but the doctor much more optimistic now about her, her recovery. Michelle Bice is home after the hip replacement, doing her rehab there. Uh, the little girl, Leighton Jane Boynton, she is eight months old, started chemotherapy this past Friday, certainly in need of prayers. And Ed Holland is having surgery on Tuesday, and is asking for our prayers. And uh, sometime back we mentioned uh, a young man who graduated from BCHS not too terribly long ago, maybe last year, uh, Jason Gooden is his name. Uh, he'd had several health issues, but just recently his blood sugar skyrocketed to over 900, and obviously that's bad, bad news. He is in the ICU at Vanderbilt to try to get that under control. Remember that young man in your prayers. We are having uh, our regular monthly meetings tonight right after we dismiss. Ladies, you're going to be uh, putting together cookies for the shut-ins at at that time. That'll be as soon as we dismiss tonight. Uh, Mark Cagle is our song director this evening. Terry Deboard is leading us in prayer. Uh, Presiding at the table is Terry Don Hargis, and Brad Pendergrass is leading the closing prayer.
pray. Dear Father in heaven, we're so thankful that you give us another opportunity to come out and sing these songs of praise to you and enjoy another portion of thy word. Dear Father, at this time we ask that you be with all the sick and afflicted that we know of at this time. Dear Father, we pray that you be with them and administer them and be with their caregivers. Dear Father, we pray that you be with our church and our church families all up down this valley. We just pray that that we're able to shine our light and bring others to you. Dear Father, we ask you to be with our country. Dear Father, be with the leaders of our country. We just pray that they would turn to you for guidance. And, and, and dear Father, we just wish that we could be a God-fearing nation and, and actually turn toward you. Dear Father, we pray that you go with us through the rest of this hour. And dear Father, we just pray that everything we do is right and well-pleasing in thy sight. Dear Father, all these things we ask in your Son's name. Amen. Amen. For our lesson, I sing number 611. Number 611.
evening, church. Good to see everybody back here for another hour of worship. It's been a great weekend, has it not, with the with the being, uh, having the opportunity to go and, and uh, be with the youth at the retreat, um, getting to be uh, with uh, Samuel and his family when Samuel was immersed into Jesus, uh, and just being together uh, an entire day is, uh, is so refreshing, it's so rejuvenating, um, and it helps me uh, to live more like Jesus, to love more like Jesus. Uh, and yeah. Ah, okay, yeah, yes, yep, yep, on thir- so, so it began on Thursday, <laughs> Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, yep, yep, absolutely, so it's, it's been, a, been a great weekend, very encouraging and very uplifting. Uh, if you would take out your Bible with me and turn to the book of Romans, book of Romans chapter 12, we are continuing in our series, verse by verse, in the, in the uh, 12th chapter of the book of Romans. Uh, the series in, is entitled, Living on the Altar. And if you can remember two weeks ago, we introduced the idea uh, that Paul is getting at in uh, verses 1 and 2 of Romans chapter 12. Paul says, um, he beseeches us, um, he begs us, he pleads us by the mercies of God by all of the grand, wondrous mercies that we see in Romans chapter 1 through, through, through 11. Um, he, he begs us, he pleads us, pleads with us because of God's mercy to present ourselves, to dedicate ourselves in loyalty as a living sacrifice. That's what we are. As New Testament Christians, we are living sacrifices. Remember how we talked about in the Old Testament, uh, the priests would offer dead sacrifices on the altar, uh, symbolizing them bearing the weight of a, of a penalty, of a punishment. But a living sacrifice is one that's alive, that doesn't bear the weight of guilt. Jesus bore that on the cross. So as we, we as New Covenant Christians can be living sacrifices that live and, and, and thrive in this world that are forgiven and have an opportunity to live in relationship with God and serve Him and give our everything. We are living sacrifices. We present ourselves as holy to God and that is what pleases Him. That's the only reasonable response. That's the only response that makes sense because of all that God has done for us. And to do that, to do that, you have to change your mind. You have to go through a metamorphosis of the mind, a transformation, a renewal by the Word of God, by the Spirit of God, your mind and your heart and your will must be transformed to align, to be in sync with the mind and the heart and the will of God. To live as a sacrifice, as a living sacrifice. So what we're going to do for the rest of this series, we're going to look at the entirety, Lord willing, of, uh, of Romans chapter 12. And we're going to look at what it means specifically to live with a transformed mind and likewise what it means to live on the altar and that's what Paul helps us with beginning in verse 3 of Romans chapter 12 that's where we're going to begin tonight verse 3 we're going to look at verses 3 through 8 uh, and I've titled this sermon grace given to serve others we have been given gifts of grace for the purpose of serving others. And that's how we live as living sacrifices. Let's see together in Romans chapter 3. This is what Paul says. Let's read the verse together. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Now let's break this down uh, word by word for a moment. Paul says the word 
for, uh, first of all, for, which is an indication, it, it, it's, a, it's a logical application of what has just ensued within verses 1 and 2. In other words, this is what verse 1 and 2 look like in action, what he's about to say in verse 3 and following. This is what it means to have a transformed mind. This is what it means to be a living sacrifice. He says, for I say, through, through the grace given to me, through the grace given to me. Paul is there referring to his um, apostolic authority, to his authority as an apostle of Jesus Christ to speak the revelation of God, to speak the word of God. He's saying, you know, I'm not just telling you because I want to order you around because I'm the boss here. I've been given this, what I'm about to tell you. I've been graced with this uh, by God and entrusted with this to communicate this truth to you. Uh, so that's what, that's what Paul says. And he says, uh, for I say through the grace given to me, here's the, um, the addressees of, of, the, of, of the plea here. To everyone who is among you. That's the church in Rome. That's whoever's reading this letter. That's you. That's me sitting in this, is sitting in the pew tonight. Paul is addressing you, and Paul is addressing me. Now, let's look even more closely at what he says next in the second half of, of, of the verse. Um, here is what, uh, here's the logical progression by the authority of the Apostle Paul, not just to the first century audience, but to us today. Here's what he commissions us to do. Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Okay, so let's try to wrap our minds around what he's meaning here. First of all, I want you to focus with me on the word faith here, the word faith. What does Paul mean when he says faith? When he says, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. What kind of faith is he talking about? He said in other letters, in Ephesians chapter 2, that we are saved by grace through faith, right? So faith plays a, plays a part, plays a role in our salvation. You must have faith uh, to be saved. And to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ. You must have that kind of faith. However, I don't believe that's the kind of faith in that sense. A saving faith that Paul is talking about in this context. Rather, in this context, Paul more so is talking about a serving faith. A serving faith as opposed to a saving faith, uh, because, he, because of what he talks about in the rest of the passage. A, a serving faith is the kind of faith that empowers me to use the gifts that God has given to me to serve others. He connects faith here with the gifts, the talents, the abilities that God has given to each and every individual Christian to serve the body of Christ. And I think you can see that. That's, that's, that's the context of the, of the entire paragraph here. Um, Paul refers to, Paul says in verse 6, having gifts that differ. He continues this same line of reasoning, the same thought progression. He connects the idea of faith here in this instance to gifts. The gifts that God has given to us. So the faith that God gives, it's more along the lines of a faith that serves, that empowers me to serve other people, not so much as saving faith. So here's the idea. Here's the idea. To sum all that up, here's, here's what Paul is getting at. God has given different gifts, uh, measures of faith. 
to each and every individual Christian. Talents, abilities, things that you have the ability to do that other people not, might not have the ability to do for, uh, so for, for the purpose of building up of uh, the, the body of Christ. And that's so true. Each, of, each and every one of us, our personalities are so different. Our skill sets are, 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 are so different. Each and every one of us has something or multiple things that we can contribute to the body of Christ. Gifts, measures of faith, talents, abilities that God has given to us to build up the body. Um, so, uh, uh, so God has given us different gifts or measures of faith. And, and it's important to, to say that. Th- these, these are gifts. They're gifts. They're gifts that God has given to you. You didn't do anything to earn these gifts by your own power, by your own strength, by your own know-how, uh, by anything that's in you. But, you know, by, by nature, a gift is something that someone gives to someone else because, because they love that person. Not primarily because that person has done something to earn that gift. Uh, a, a gift by nature is something that's freely given, right? To somebody um, that, that, that they love as an expression of, as an expression of love and ex, as an expression of grace. So one of the silliest things that you could do is to think of yourself in this elevated kind of way when you view your gifts, thinking of yourself more highly than you ought to think in relation to someone else and their gifts as, as, as better than um, an, 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 another person. Uh, because um, what you have, the gift that you have, the ability that you have, the talent that you have, has been given to you. It's not something that originates within you by your own power, by your own strength. It's a gift. So it's silly to say, uh, you, 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 you know, I am so much better because I can do this and nobody else can. That's silly to think like that. It, it, it would be like, um, it would be like a, a kid at Christmas time who says uh, to the, all, all the other kids, look at my toys that I have. Look at what my parents have, have, have given to me with their hard-earned money that I didn't do anything for. I'm so much better than all the other kids because of the gifts that I have. That would be silly, right? To do something like that because that toy that was given to the child at Christmas, it was a gift. It was something given to them. And what Paul is saying essentially is, is this. We have zero reason. We have absolutely zero reason to live with the spirit of pride. We have zero reason to be prideful because everything that we have, everything that we have been graced with is a gift from God. If we have a gift, if we have a talent that we use to serve the body of Christ, it's only because God has given it to us. It's only because God has graced us with that gift. So therefore, we should think soberly about the things that we have, the gifts that we have. That's what Paul is essentially saying. And I think an an application for us, as we seek to be New Testament Christians who live on the altar with a transformed mind, a transformed mind, a a mind that is undergoing a metamorphosis, a a change that aligns its will with the will of God, is a mind that looks at itself honestly. It's a mind that evaluates itself honestly. It's a mind that says, everything that I have is, is from God. So to have this kind of uh, prideful spirit and say, you know, I'm just, I, I, am, I am so much better than somebody else because of what I have is absolutely silly. Because everything that you have has been given to you from above by God himself. Um, we've been given individual gifts 
of grace to serve others and not to make much of ourselves, not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, but to use them so that the church may be built up in love. So a transformed mind thinks honestly, uh, looks, looks internally at itself with honesty and doesn't think of itself more highly than it ought to think. And then Paul gives us an illustration to explain how these gifts of grace work within the body of Christ. Each and every single one of us have a talent, have an ability, have something that we have been graced with. And then Paul goes further, he talks about how that, what that looks like, how, that, how that's supposed to function and work within the body. Notice with me in verse 4 of Romans chapter 12. Here's the illustration. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. Uh, We know that it's the case that a body has an array of different parts that work together to make it function. You know, the, the, the eyes are, the eyes are foreseeing. So the feet know where to go, right? Uh, the, the, the nose is for smelling, so the mouth knows what tastes good, what to eat. Uh, the ears are for hearing, so the neck knows where to turn and look. If somebody says something, I can hear it and I can turn and I can, and I, and I can look. And, and it, it, would be, it, it would be absolutely silly to, to say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so much better than... Um, uh, than, than uh, it would be silly for the hands to say, you know, I'm so much better than the eyes because I can reach out and grab something. Um, that's, that, that's, that's absolutely silly because the hands need the eyes to reach out and grab the object that it's trying to grab. All of them are dependent upon one another. All of them need each other to function properly as they are intended to function. And likewise, you know, it, it would be silly for, say, the nose to say, you know, I'm just, I'm not good enough because I'm not a mouth. I can't do the things that the mouth can do. So therefore, I'm inept. I'm, I'm just not good enough. I don't have... What it takes. It would be silly to say something like that because each part of the body needs all of the other parts to function and to live and to thrive and to grow. Each part of the body, the hands, the feet, the eyes, the nose, the, the ears is, is different and carries a certain role, but each and every one of those parts is dependent upon the other is dependent upon the other. So it is with the church. That's the illustration. Here's the application. Look at verse 5, if you will. So we, being many, are one body in Christ. And in focus, what he says here, and individually members members of one another. We're members one of another. The church is like a body that has different parts, that has different, um, in, d- different individual members, and all of those individual members are dependent upon the other to thrive and to live as God intends us to live. Uh, and w- 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 one of the things that we can conclude from this is that a transformed mind, a mind that is going through a change, a metamorphosis by the word of God, is a mind that sees its source of life in its connection with the church. A transformed mind sees its source of life in its own connection with the church. You know, just as individual body parts can't thrive and function apart from each other, individual Christians, it's not by God's design for us to grow and thrive and and, and do what pleases God on our own (laughs) without one another, 
We're supposed to be connected with each other. We're supposed to find our source of spiritual life and spiritual sustenance in the body that's connected to Jesus Christ. In other words, one of the major things that Paul is saying in this, in this passage is that we need each other. We need each other. We need each other's gifts of grace. The gifts that God has given to us as individuals, the whole body, we need that from one another. We, we, we need that to grow and to thrive spiritually. And, you know, this idea... Uh, of, uh, of needing each other, of, of living in, in a family or a community of, of, of faith that, 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 is, that is dependent upon one another. It's so contrary to so many people's idea of faith today. What faith is supposed to look like. In, in, in our kind of Americanized Western culture version of, of Christianity, so often we approach faith as this private individual experience where it's just me and God and no one else. <laughs> and that's true to a degree. We have, to a degree, a private relationship with God. God commands us to pray privately and cultivate our walk personally with Him. But to say that the primary expression of faith is to be in a private kind of setting where it's just me and God and no one else is vastly different from what we see revealed within Scripture. Jesus, rather, has designed faith to be lived in its fullest expression in community, in a family, where we are dependent upon one another. Where we are like eyes and noses and ears and feet and all the other parts of the body that need the other parts to live and grow and thrive and be the kind of people that God wants us to be. So a transformed mind, it doesn't, it doesn't try to one-up other people in, in, the, in the body. It doesn't say, since I'm this part, I am so much better than all the other parts. A transformed mind is one who has this vision of the church as being connected to the body. That's its source of life. That's its source of sustenance because the body is ultimately connected to Jesus Christ. Um, so, uh, so it doesn't live with a spirit of pride, but it thinks, it thinks soberly. Um, it, 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 a, a transformed mind, it, it looks at other Christians um, and, and says, you know, I need what you have. <laughs> I need what God has given to you to be encouraged, to be uplifted to grow into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And not only that, likewise, it looks at other Christians and it says, um, I have something that you need. And I'm going to humbly use that and serve you with what I have so that you likewise may be encouraged and built up and edified and so that you may grow. We're dependent upon one another and we need each other just like individual body parts need the others to, to function and thrive. I think that's uh, the main gist of what Paul is, is saying uh, here. That's living on the altar. <laughs> that's a transformed mind that sees the church of the living God in that kind of a way. Uh, okay, so let's, let's go to verse 6. Paul says, having then gifts. And, and he, he goes, he gets more specific about uh, the abilities and the talents that we have been graced with by God. He gets more specific, specific 
in uh, verses 6, 7, and 8. Verse, verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that's given to us. And then he says, let us use them. The gifts that you have, the gifts that God has given to you, let us use them. What does it look like to live on the altar? Here's what Paul says. Living on the altar means to use what you have been given by God to serve the body of Christ. The talents, the abilities, whatever that you have at your disposal, use that. Use that to serve. Use what you have been graced with to serve the body. All for the glory of God. Uh, so, and then, and then he talks about, you know, specific things, uh, specific gifts that God has given to um, individuals with, within, within the church. And I think there are uh, seven, seven or so, I might, might be wrong, I, I can't remember, uh, but se- seven or so gifts uh, that he lists here. But I don't, I don't think this is meant to be like an exhaustive list of gifts and or talents that God gives within the church. I don't think it's Paul's intent to say, hey, you know, the summation of everything that God gives is right here. Um, I think these are maybe general categories of things that, that God gives, but, but they can be helpful um, to us as we attempt to discover our talents and abilities and, and to use them uh, for God's glory. Let's, let's briefly look at, look at some of these. Um, Paul says... Later in verse 6, if prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Uh, now, I, I don't believe, uh, I, I think scripture itself testifies to this. I don't believe that God gives new revelation to individuals apart from what's revealed in the word. Um, I, think, I don't think prophecy in the sense of God giving me something new that's outside of Scripture is a spiritual gift that He gives today, in, in other words. And, and that's a, a, a whole other a discussion for, for, for another time. But, but I do think, in a certain sense, that the gift of prophecy um, is, uh, is, is something that someone could very well in, in, the, in the 21st century be, be graced with. You know, a, a prophet, and we, we see, you know, the prophets in, in the Old Testament. Um, we, see, we, we read about Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, some of the minor prophets. Uh, one of, two of the major things that they were um, tasked with doing was uh, foretelling uh, foretelling uh, prophets in the Old Testament, uh, in the New Testament, would would uh, predict the future and and give new revelation from from God. Uh, prophets were tasked with foretelling, but prophets also, and even m- arguably more times than than the other, they uh, were um, tasked with foretelling. Uh, foretelling and forthtelling. Forthtelling is proclaiming. Forthtelling is preaching. Forthtelling is taking the word of God and heralding it in a way that convicts and encourages and consoles and comforts and maybe even steps on toes in the appropriate way. Uh, So a, a prophet biblically, is not one who just has a crystal ball that, that looks into the future. That's the idea of a lot of people today who have, uh, that, that's some people's idea of, of what a prophet, what a prophet is. But, um, but also, biblically, a prophet is one who proclaims the word of God powerfully in a way that convicts, in a way that encourages, in a way that changes people and people walk away from it and say that word not the guy that presented it but that word 
convicts me. It convicts me to change. It convicts me to go another path. Uh, so the gift of, you know, as we can define it in a first century context, you could say, you know, prophecy or preaching. Uh, preaching in a way that um, convicts is perhaps a gift um, that, um, that, that God gives. Um, another one, Paul says in verse 7, or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. Uh, another way that you could translate this is service, um, acts of service. Um, the, the aptitude of someone to, uh, to um, sacrifice of, of their time uh, to, um, to meet a physical need that someone has. Uh, I, I, I knew of this, um, uh, this uh, man at, uh, at, at my other work. Um, I'm, not, I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to be mean, but um, he, he was the kind of guy where you would look at and you would say, oh, bless his heart, you know. Um, but he had an amazing gift, an amazing aptitude to look at someone and, and identify immediately what that person needs physically. And he would be the first person to meet that need. I remember uh, when um, one time Anna was uh, driving and she hit a deer. And I'm, I'm actually, it's, it was on a Sunday night. She was on the way to church. I had to come to church early to, to go to an elders meeting. Um, and she calls me and she says that she hit a deer. Uh, and uh, Titus was small at that time. And of course, I'm like in almost panic mode um, because I've seen what deer can do to, do to cars and, and everything. So I'm thinking like, what in the world do I need to go there uh, right now? And this man was standing there and heard me how I was in such distress. And immediately when I got off the phone, he looked at me and said, what do I need to do? Who do I need to call? Where do I need to go? How can I help you right now? That's the gift of service. That's the gift of ministry. And God graces people with a special aptitude to do that. Uh, Paul also says, he who teaches in teaching. Uh, if you look at, I, you know, we won't do this tonight, but if, but if you look at some words in the original language, there, there, there's a little bit different nuance between preaching and teaching. Um, preaching is more heralding the truth in a way that motivates and convicts. Um, teaching is more communicating accurate information in a way that people can understand it. Uh, the two blend together, but there is a sphere where they are separate. Um, and some people, uh, I think, are gift with, gifted with teaching uh, more so than others, that have a special ability to parse out the Word of God um, and, 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 um, and, and, and tell it in a way um, as it's originally intended so everybody can look at it and say, oh, wow, okay, I never thought about it that way. I can, I can see that more clearly by, by how you have explained it. Uh, because it's the gift of teaching. Uh, and a gift that God, God gives. Uh, let, let's, let's keep going in, in verse 8. He who exhorts in his exhortation. Um, word or exhort or encourage. One who has the special ability of, of, uh, of building people up. You know, I've had these people in my life that are just, that are just encouragers. That are just have this special talent. This special gift. Of seeing and maybe an expression on my face or knowing something that I'm going through, and they just know the right thing to say at the right time to say it and and make me feel a way that make make me just feel loved and 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 cared for um, uh, that's that's encouragement that's exhortation, and some people have a a special act for that. And that's a gift. That's a gift that God gives 
to people. Uh, let's, let's, let's keep going. He who gives with liberality. Um, some people have the, uh, the special interest or, or talent or, or ability to, to, to give what, what they have. And, and I don't think Paul is using just uh, money uh, as an example. Someone who gives freely of, of, their, of maybe their time, of their possessions... Uh, of, of, of their money, someone who just, who, who just gives. And, and you know, I'm, I'm sure you know someone who fits this description, maybe even many, many of you, who would just give someone the shirt off their back uh, in, in any given situation. It doesn't matter how much. It doesn't matter how much they have to sacrifice. They just want, they just want to give. They just want to give. That's a gift. That's a gift. That God gives as a gift of grace. Uh, let's continue. He, he who leads, he who leads with, with diligence. You know, some people have the special ability of, um, of, of motivating people, of taking a group of people and getting them from point A to point B. It, it takes a, spe- it's a special skill set. It takes a special person, a special skill set to be a leader. In that, uh, in, 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 that, in that sense. And maybe that's you. That's certainly a gift that God gives. And then lastly, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Um, I, I knew of, a, of, another, of another man uh, at, at, a, at a former work. And he was, um, he was over our, we, we did a jail ministry uh, and he was over that. He would go just constantly um, to, to the jail and spend hours and hours and hours and hours with, uh, with, his, uh, with his students there, ministering to them. He would, um, he, he would try to get to know them after they would, they would get out. And, and he would, would bear with them when they would relapse and... and um, and, uh, and, and, and maybe go back to some uh, former behaviors that were not good. Um, he would stick with them. He would show them tenderness and, and compassion uh, and mercy. That man, I believe, has this, this, this kind of thing that we're talking about. This gift of this special ability to look at someone, even, even past their faults and past their failures, this special ability to look at somebody deeply uh, with, with a vision that sees them as just immensely valuable and is willing to sacrifice so much so that this person may be blessed, even though they um, are hard to love. Uh, that's a gift. That's a gift. Uh, and that's a gift that certainly God gives. Uh, so as, as, we, as we close tonight, um, living on the altar, having a transformed mind, what it means is to identify your gift. Ask yourself this, what is my gift? If you're a Christian, you have a gift. If you're a Christian... You have been gifted by God with a gift of grace. Maybe you haven't discovered that gift yet. Maybe you have... Some, some gifts take time to cultivate. And they take time to grow. Maybe you haven't cultivated your gift. Um, and just some... You know, I've, I've counseled some people on how to, you know, find their gift and to use their gift. If you don't know... If, if you're asking the question, well, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what, what God has, has given... Give, given to me. Well, you know, ask, ask yourself, what are you good at? What are you, what, what, what are some things that you have the ability of doing that maybe other people don't? That could very well be an indication of, of, your, of your gift. Uh, what do you enjoy doing? What do you love to do that just, that brings a lot of joy to you in the service of the church and in the service of in the service of God. There are things that I enjoy doing more than other things. That very well could be an indication of your gift. Uh, and uh, another way to identify your gift is ask someone. Ask someone that knows you. 
Ask someone that knows you well. Say, you know, I'm, just, I'm, I'm trying to identify, trying to see what God has given to me, and I'm, I'm having some trouble, and you seem to know me. Uh, what am I good at? What am I... Uh, what, what, what do you see in me? What, what kind of potential do you see in me? And someone who knows you well can very, um, could uh, um, very possibly point you in the right direction. But the point is this. Living on the altar, living on the altar of sacrifice, it means to identify your gift, to see it not with the spirit of pride and um, and self-exaltation, but to see it with the spirit of humility and use it. Use it with all of your might to bless um, and to build up so that the church may be built up in love. That's what it means to live on the altar. Uh, tonight, if anyone has need, if anyone needs Christ, if you know you don't have Christ, uh, the invitation is extended to you uh, believe in Him, repent of your sins. You can come and confess your faith and be immersed into Jesus Christ and walk with Him anew. If you have any need, why don't you come forward as we stand and as we sing. Is anyone here tonight that needs a communion cup? Uh, if you'll peel back the cellophane wrapper, you'll get to the bread. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day and the wonderful blessing you bless us with. Father, be with those now who partake of this loaf, which thus is the body of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. May those who partake of it do so in a way that's well pleasing with thee. Be blessed and blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. In like manner, Heavenly Father, we offer thanks for this fruit of the vine, which to us is the shed blood of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. May those who partake of it do so in a way that's well pleasing with thee. These blessed to us in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're again thankful for allowing us another opportunity to join together here tonight to hear another portion of your word. And Father, at this time, we're again mindful of all the ones that were mentioned that need our prayers of being sick, the ones that are undergoing treatments, the ones that are facing surgeries or have had surgeries in the past. We ask that you continue to be with the ones that are in the nursing homes, the ones that are shut in. We ask that you be with the caregivers, whether doctors, nurses, family members, whoever may be tending to them. We ask that you would allow them, lay a healing hand on them, allow them to turn back to their original health, as, if it be thy will, as quickly as possible. Father, we'd ask that you be with all the ones that have lost loved ones over the weeks and months and years. You continue to be with them, comfort them, and help them to be strong during this time. Father, we continue to, play, to pray for our country and all the nations the world over. We ask that something might be done, that peace would be restored back to the world, if it be your will. And Father, we ask that you go with each of us this week as we are about to depart and Go to our, as we depart to our jobs and have safe commutes to and from our homes each day so that we may be able to return here at the next appointed time to study another portion of our word. We ask that you continue to guide, guard, and direct us, continue forgiving us for our sins, and continue to allow us to share health and happiness we share within our families. All these blessings we ask in Christ's name. Amen.